thank you so much. This is such a happy town. It's a, it's a great place to be. Uh, I would like nothing better than to catalyze a beautiful brainstorming with, session with you about building a platform to learn on. And by platform, I don't mean like software and stuff. I mean an entire environment where anybody of any age could learn things. And they would just be turbocharged. They would be catapulted through the, the atmosphere because they'd be so happy doing it. It would pay off so well. But I feel like we're stuck. We're stuck inside a box, and this box is really hard to see. So what I'd like to do is invite you to walk outside the box and look around at it. And what I'm going to try to do is take us outside the box a little bit. And I'll start with my not that distinguished uh, educational career of 18 years, uh, which I would say was mostly characterized by um, luck and privilege. So this is me uh, in, uh, when I was eight years old, funny exercise, uh, in third grade and uh, in Lima, Peru. So I had the luck of being raised for the first 12 years of my life down in South America, 10 years in Lima, two years in Buenos Aires. I had the luck of growing up learning several languages. So I speak natively English, Spanish, German. Uh, and I had the privilege of being a white male in an upper middle class expat family living a really nice lifestyle down here. And yes, that's me down here on the right. Um, <laughs> but I started looking back at these pictures and I realized I don't remember who this is. I don't know who my third grade teacher was. I don't remember who my fourth grade teacher was. I don't remember who my third, you know, any, any of that stuff. And that led me to reflect, and I'd like you to join me for a second in reflecting on your entire learning career. Look back on, you know, if it was 10 years long, 18, 20 years, however many advanced degrees you've done. Think back to how many people did you have, like uh, Antonio's telling us yesterday about Mrs. Hirschman, how many Mrs. Hirschmans did you have in your life? Make a count and say it out loud once you've kind of gone through. Give me a number. Once you've thought through, three, two, two, five, two, five seven, six, five. five, awesome. So, so the numbers I usually hear if I ask this question are between three and five, which immediately makes me ask the question, what? <laughs> really? Only three to five? Like, I was there for 18 years. My number's five. What happened? Couldn't we cough up something a little better than that? More people being more significant in our lives. What happened? Why, why are we in this particular situation? So let's go a little deeper. Let's settle into the question. And I want you to put yourself back to when you were five years old. So think about yourself at five, right? Before you go to school. And think about all the things that you learned by the time you were five. You learned to speak probably a language, maybe a couple languages. You learned to stand, run, walk, run the bases, learn the rules of many games, learn how to bend the rules or innovate on the rules, learn how to cheat, learn how to blame your sister for something. You learn family dynamics, social dynamics, um, all sorts of intriguing things. Children are really completely wired to absorb and learn and be, be astute this way. And note how you learned. You learned completely naturally. You learned socially. You learned by example. You watched people. You hung out. You, you, you know, it was all you skinned your knees, the whole thing, right? So then we put you in a place that's a little more modern than this. <laughs> so let me ask you, what about this situation looks normal? I'm trying to pull you out of the box a little bit. What looks normal here? And, and ignore the fact that all these children have their arms sort of behind their, head, their, their backs. <laughs> that's definitely abnormal. But what about this looks normal? Well, we've divided them up into rows and columns. They, by the luck of the draw, they're sort of sitting there within a 12-month range of each other. They're supposed to all learn together. By the luck of math, depending on how many teachers they had in the classroom size, they're divided up into a number. And we're going to teach them the same thing at the same time in the same way and hope they learn. And if you listen to Casey Kwa yesterday, you'd be like, ooh. I can imagine a lot of people may not fit really well in that system, and it may not, in fact, develop a lot of really great students. Why do we have this? Now, I've heard a lot of speeches that begin with this example of, um, if you took a doctor from 1,000 years ago and dropped them in a modern hospital, they wouldn't know what to do. They wouldn't know about bacteria and infection, all the gear and gizmos, HIPAA rules. They wouldn't know anything, right? <laughs> But if you took a, a, a teacher from 1,000 years ago and dropped them in a modern classroom, they'd feel right at home because it's so backward. We haven't changed anything. This little example is wrong. It's wrong. 1,000 years ago, we had very tiny classrooms. We had informal learning. We had children who had duties, who were out in the field doing things, who had duties at home, responsibilities. They were part of communities. This thing is a really modern invention. I want to tell you a little bit more about it. It happened roughly around the time the Industrial Revolution hit. So what did we do? We borrowed this thing 
and kind of emulated it. We industrialized an education system that had actually created pretty smart people before that in very informal and casual ways, but we wanted to sort of make sure everybody did it. This happened um, at this interesting time between the US Civil War, and I'm going to use the US as a model here, between the Civil War and World War I, World War II. Back in, in 1860, 90% of us are farmers. We're raising cows, raising corn, raising tomatoes, whatever. And then this declines pretty quickly to the point where by 1930, at the beginning of the Great Depression, only 21% of us are farmers anymore. The number today is 1.5%. Right? So all these people left farming, what did they do? Well, this industrial revolution thing really wanted workers, it wanted factory workers, and factory work wasn't the coolest thing, especially in old factories, so we kind of had to train people to be minimally capable there, but we also wanted them to make enough money to become consumers. And I'll flag the word consumers because consumer, that word, is the start of my journey to the point where, that I've gotten to that I'm, try, that I'm explaining here. And we did all this, we put on the engineering hat. We said, okay, we're gonna, we need efficiency and scale because there's so many people we have to teach and there's just not a lot of money. Uh, and we did this also kind of out of this notion of fairness. And maybe that's a way to make it compulsory so everybody must learn. It's fair that everybody gets roughly the same sort of education. And maybe you think this is okay. And maybe you look at the results today and you think, well, our system's doing kinda all right, but, but I don't think so. But my head was blown open back around 1991, 92, when a friend of mine sent me an essay by this guy. His name is John Taylor Gatto, G-A-T-T-O. He's a retired New York high school teacher, still alive, a little grumpy. Um, and the essay was called The Sixth Lesson School Teacher. And I'm, I'm gonna sort of channel it a little bit for you. And he said, look, pretend I gave you a, a poetry assignment in class. And you're busy writing and you're really excited and the words are pouring out of your fingers. You're, you're creating something you really like. You're in the flow and then the bell rings. So we're not going to say anything, but what does everybody know is going to happen right now? We know you're going to put down that pen and you're going to walk over to math class. What did we just teach you? By the way, every hour for a dozen years, maybe longer. What did we just teach you? We just taught you that the giant metronome that runs this place is more important than your flow, your passion, your desire to do something, your curiosity. Later, we're gonna ask you to have grit and focus and determination and really stick to something, but we're only ever gonna give you 25 minutes in class. Right? That's one lesson of the hidden curriculum of school, and that's what Gatto was exposing. He said, nominally I'm your teacher, but let me tell you what I'm really teaching you. Another one is, you can never be left alone anywhere. You will have no privacy. Another one is, you're going to be evaluated by people outside this room who will never meet you, don't care about you, and have developed these little standardized tests that they're going to, like your whole career depends on those things. And we're never going to ask these people who know whether you're the goof off or the smart kid, and who know whether you collaborate or not. We're just not going to ask them, right? So, this has given us what I call the modern OCD. We, have, we are obedient, compliant, and dependent. We have adult children. We have a system that is designed to give us adult children. All right? And I want to just call out for a second, there are a tremendous number of well-intentioned people in the system. There are a tremendous number of people who are inventing terrific things. People are experimenting with, with you know, new projects that I have great uh, hope for. And yet the system itself is genetically flawed but it gets a little worse, okay? Uh, because we've designed the system for mistrust, we've turned a lot of things that are abundant into scarcities. So you could learn math conceivably from anybody at any cash register or anybody who's sitting down doing sums, but you, no, 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 you have to learn from a PhD teacher who got qualified and went to the right college and isn't being paid enough and is sitting in front of you, and maybe you like them, maybe you don't, but that's how you're gonna learn math. And then we're gonna give you worksheets to do afterward that have no bearing to anything in real life, right? Um, and there's tons of scarcities. I can just keep going on those. Uh, if you're curious, if you're genuinely curious, you're a troublemaker. What do you mean you want to learn about geography? We're in math class right now, right? Um, and then we stripped away, we snipped away a whole bunch of things. Like in the modern compulsory education system, I'm no longer responsible for learning. I'm responsible for showing up on time. I'm responsible for understanding my, my role, my, my place in the whole system. I'm responsible for regurgitating whatever they want me to do on the test, but not really for being actively curious and learning. They took away the relationships I need to learn things. I can't go outside and connect with humans to go learn the stuff that's in the world. And they took away meaning. We're performing inside of these schools that are little petri dishes that increasingly resemble penitentiaries because things have gotten really bad in school between bullying and SWAT teams and Col Columbine and who knows what. That's, what, that's what's happened. And I'm, I'm stereotyping a bit, but I don't think I'm stretching it that far. So why do we build systems using coercion? Partly it's because we don't trust people. And the big aha that I got, 
the coin that dropped in my head is that this isn't just true of education, it's true of every sector. The entertainment business protects their goodies against us because they don't trust us to do something with them and take them apart and remix them and share them properly and still somehow get artists paid. Um, the food system is this way, the governance system. The reason Obama and Romney needed a lot of money from us was to feed the TV system and show us ads, right? So this is a bit of a, a glum place, um, but I think now we've stepped far enough outside the box that we can kind of look around. And I'd like to use the five W's of journalism, the who, what, when, where, why, and how, to just brainstorm for a little bit about, all right, now what could you do if you actually trusted people? So the question I like to ask is, what if we trusted you? And the we and the you is kind of ambiguous. It's all of us. It's us, right? The we is us. We kind of, we're kind of complicit. We didn't create it. We're in it. We could do a lot better. And what I want to do is think, how could we do better? So let's start by who and go around. The who that's kind of obvious is, OK, so who's going to teach us? Well, there's probably a big market for more tutors and coaches. But then there are real humans with real jobs in the world, many, 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 many of them, who would love to spend some time showing you what they do, teaching. So we're ignoring that resource. That's, a, that's an abundance. But then the really interesting question is, who should you learn with? Right now, that's, that's determined by random lotto. You land in a class with people who were born in the same 12 months, which is nuts. What about finding people who are in the same stages of learning how to mix drinks for an evening, and that's your cohort? Or how to, how to speak colloquial Mandarin Chinese, and it takes you five or six or seven or 10 years, and that's your cohort. And some cohorts work, some don't, you explore. So that's interesting from the who. We also need mentors. We need available people who are pretty wise and, and I'd be like, I really want to know about the history of coffee. And the mentor would say, well, here's a couple good books, and you might want to go look over here. So mentors are really useful. And mentors get us over toward the what, because then we want to start talking about pathways of learning. But the what that really matters to me is, how do I preserve curiosity in children? They're born with it. We stamp it out. We socialize it out of them. How do we help them remember they have agency, permission to do things? How do we help them remember that they can go change the world when the system is busy reinforcing that they shouldn't, can't, won't? So I'm going to leave the rest of what over for why, because why is really big and really important. When might be obvious to you. When is like, well, any time. I could do math right now, except it would be inconvenient for you. Um, but you could learn anything, any place. But then you start thinking, well, maybe a learner of any age needs to learn to manage their time and learns to you know, do life balance kind of things. And then you start looking at brain science and thinking there's this thing called the reinforcement schedule. Our, our memories decay at a certain rate. Why don't we use things to help us learn at the right moment so that we learn better, faster, deeper, et cetera? Where? You can learn any place, any place in the world. There's um, ecotourism, right? There's a pretty big and growing industry about ecology tourism. Why is there no edutourism? Why don't we have edutourism? I'll tell you why. The children are all captives in schools. <laughs> And it's really hard. It's like the parents are worried that if they miss this week, their children will be set back and they'll never get into Harvard and they'll like marry like somebody ugly and it'll be awful, <laughs> right? And, and so that doesn't have to happen quite that way. And luckily, people are experiment, experimenting with new things. Then the why is really the big thing. If you break out of the box and you start seeing that the world is a little messed up, and if you are with me so far down this little journey that the educational system is kind of messed up, and if you heard me say that this applies to every sector of society, maybe we have a chance to fix those things. And maybe if you fix them with real people doing real work on real problems, good things come out the other end. So the why is really, really huge. And we need to enable that with a lot of how. And the how is beautiful. We've heard from a series of really nice apprenticeship programs and a variety of other things here that there's new ways that are really old ways of learning that sound so unusual. They sound like, oh, they're really exotic. You're going to step out and not go to college. Really? We were doing that for, for centuries, millennia. That's how people always learned. Uh, guilds, apprenticeships, whatever else it might be. And then there's, there's also soft software and tools that can help. But don't get too hung up on the software. And you know, Khan Academy has basically done a whole bunch of programs you can go watch. Well. Behind the, behind the curtain in Khan Academy is a whole bunch of rating and who's stuck where that teachers get to see, that experts get to see. Why don't the kids get to see that? Why don't people learning get to see the stuff behind the curtain? So be a little suspicious of some of the software in particular if it's all locked up and doesn't work openly. Because we, the how, is we can build the curriculum with each other. It can be openly available. Don't need to have big companies that sell us $250 textbooks. Don't need to have everything locked away. That's part of the problem from a different industry. So 
If you'd like to play a little more on this, there's a couple different ways. One is I just uh, a year ago did a talk, a TEDx talk uh, in Copenhagen. It's called What If We Trusted You? So you can watch that on YouTube. Uh, a second one is, and I could do a day-long talk on this, I use a piece of software called The Brain, which uh, was developed uh, 15 years ago. I've been filling this brain for 15 years. You can go see it at jerrysbrain.com, and everything I mentioned here is in there. Third, I'm writing a book called What If We Trusted You?, which I think of as a seed bomb thrown into cyberspace. So I'm going to plant this thing out in this nice environment where we can share and collaborate and see where it goes. I'll close with my, one of my favorite quotes from Mark Twain. What gets us into trouble is not what we don't know. It's what we know for sure, but just ain't so. Thank you very much.